Hey, what's up, guys? My name's Andy, and you're watching Andy's Book Club. So in case you've been living under a rock lately, you know what's going on out there in the world with the whole outbreak and stuff. So if you're wondering why the set looks a little different today, that's why. Because I'm in self-isolation and I can't get into the usual classroom that I usually film in. But you know what? The show must go on. So today we're moving right along with chapter two of The Tipping Point. So we're continuing to discuss things like epidemics and diseases and the spreading of ideas, which is oddly ironic with today's situation. Without further ado, let's move along. So chapter two begins with Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. So some of you might be familiar with this particular part of history. So Paul Revere, he was a famous famous uh, American person who uh, warned of an uh, impending British invasion uh, during the American War for Independence. Well, Paul Revere is very uh, revered in American history because of his contributions, because uh, of his midnight ride. He warned a lot of people who otherwise would have been asleep uh, in the middle of the night. And as a result, the Americans were ready to uh, defend themselves from the British when the British army came the next day. So Paul Revere is credited with warning a lot of people uh, and saving a lot of lives potentially, and uh, maybe even changing the course of history entirely. So what you might not know is that uh, before Paul Revere's Midnight Ride, there's also another person that uh, did a similar sort of midnight ride, and his name was William Daw. So William Daw did sort of the same idea. He also knew about the impending British invasion, uh, and then he tried to warn a lot of people. Uh, and also, it was at night as well. Uh, but his midnight ride was not nearly as successful as Paul Revere. And there's a reason why we remember Paul Revere, but not William Daw. Now, before we go back to answer the question as to what exactly the difference between Paul Revere and William Daw is, uh, let me quickly explain the idea of the six degrees of separation. So some of you might be familiar with the six degrees of separation. So it's the idea that um, a lot of people, almost everyone in the world, in fact, uh, is connected through six people. So, for example, uh, I know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody, uh, do that six times, uh, that knows, let's say, the Pope or the President of Russia or uh, just anyone, right? So anyone in the world uh, is separated by six degrees at most. So some sometimes you might be separated by less, right? So if you live in, let's say, the same country as someone, uh, then even if it's a celebrity or someone famous, you might be connected by less than six degrees. But six degrees is the maximum uh, out of uh, pretty much everyone. So we're all connected through like a gigantic network. And a lot of you might be familiar with this idea or you've heard uh, of it somewhere before. So there was this experiment done where these participants were asked to send letters to this investment banker that was based in, I believe, Boston. So the participants were asked to send a letter to someone that they didn't know. And what ended up happening is that they would just give it to someone who they think would get the letter closer to that person. So they didn't know who this investment banker is, but let's say they know someone who works in finance, right? So if they have a friend in finance, they'll give it to that person in finance and maybe you know someone, right? So then they give it to that person and that person will send it to another person. In the end, some of the letters actually made it to the person uh, in Boston. So what they found out was that half of the letters that eventually arrived at the person's house came from just three people. So that means not, that not all of the degrees were equal, right? So the majority of the letters came from just a few people. And if you think not just about sending letters, but about life in general, so you would notice that probably out of your friends group, a lot of your friends that you have now, you met through one or two people. So the majority of your friends you probably met through a single person. And something like that is also validated by the names experiment. So the names experiment is basically when you pass out a list of, uh, let's say, a hundred names of uh, people, of just random names that you think that people would know. And then they would give a tick for every name that they knew that was on the list. So if they, for example, they know someone named John, they would tick off John, right? So the higher the score, then that means the more people that they know. So the names experiment really demonstrates that uh, for the majority of people, they they know like an average um, of maybe like 20, 30 people. What the names experiment basically demonstrates is that you have a few people that knows a lot of people. So these people are called the connectors. So 
uh, the connectors are the ones that sort of uh, link the world together in this vast network, right? So these are the people that have a very disproportionately high amount of social connections, and they're the ones who are good at getting messages or getting uh, information passed over to uh, more people. Uh, so examples of super social people that are connectors, uh, the author brings up people like Roger Horchow and Lois Weisberg. An interesting thing about Horchow, which the author interviewed, is that Horchow would keep a list of all the people that he met and information about them and things like when their birthday was. And then when their birthday came, he would make sure to send a personalized card to them and then in the mail. And then uh, that would make people feel really good, right? So then they would receive like a personalized happy birthday message. And he would just have this whole book of when people's birthdays was and when he should send these cards. So uh, these are the people that really value social connection and take social connection to the next level. So uh, these are the people that don't really do well in situations like this when we have to socially isolate. That's, uh, uh, I guess, another relevant thing that we can talk about today. And another point that the author makes that's important to note is that uh, you would notice that most people get job offers through personal references. So uh, the thing with personal references is that employers feel more comfortable hiring someone that was referred to by another employee, right? So they don't necessarily feel the most comfortable uh, with just hiring someone right off the bat off of like some internet application or some resume that just came in. So if you have someone uh, on the inside that recommends you or someone that the boss or the employer or the hire manager knows, uh, then if that person refers you, then then you would get a much higher chance of getting the job. So going back to Paul Revere versus William Daw, and the reason why Paul Revere was much more successful than William Daw uh, when he was doing his midnight ride. Uh, the reason for that was Paul Revere was a connector while William Daw was not. So Paul Revere uh, is known for being very charismatic uh, and a very just a generally sociable guy. And he knew a lot of people uh, that were in pretty high ranking government positions uh, in the American continental uh, like Congress or whatever the government was at the time. Uh, so he knew where all the mayors and all the governors and all the uh, you know people in charge and all the military leaders were. So uh, when he did his midnight ride, he knew exactly which door to knock on and who to warn, right? Because if you're William Daw and you go to uh, warn people about an impending British invasion and you just knock on some door of like some random farmer, uh, the, f the guy will go, hey, like, I don't, I'm not in charge here. I don't know what to do. Like, what do you want me to do with this information, right? I can, uh, thanks for telling me, I can gather my pitchfork and defend my family, but I'm not going to be able to help you organize uh, a defense against the British, right? So what Paul Revere did was that he knew where all the governors and all the military leaders and all the mayors were. So he just picked those houses to go to so that he can cover a lot more houses uh, in the short span of time and make sure that each house was an important person that would actually be able to do something about this situation rather than just conveying the information. So he managed to get the information to the correct people. And that's a big difference between Paul Revere and William Daw. And a lot of the few are is really in effect here, right? Because those people that are good at spreading messages, they uh, know which social contacts are valuable and which social contacts are uh, maybe not so valuable and they know how to use that to sort of convey their message or convey information. And, and now let's move on to the definition of what a maven is. So maven is a Yiddish word that generally means something like accumulator of knowledge. So a maven is just someone who sort of audits the information and pulls out uh, information that's really good and just summarizes it in a way such that uh, people can uh, be interested and really understand it. So for example, uh, a market maven is someone who maybe follows the prices of just random goods very closely, right? So if you ever picked up like a a box of toothpaste or something, right? So if you pick up a little box of toothpaste on the back, it says, if you're unsatisfied with this product, please call this toll-free number. Now, you might be thinking like, who in the right mind would call 
into like a toll-free number for a random box of toothpaste and tell them what their product is, whether their product is good or not. Well, you know, you'd be surprised. Some people actually do, right? So for the people that actually do, they're probably the market mavens because they they really care about these things, right? So they care about uh, you know, whether or not people are getting the best deals or people are getting ripped off or not. So another example is that uh, sometimes grocery stores will try to pull a quick one on you and they'll uh, raise the price of something suddenly and then drop it back down to its regular level and call the regular level uh, uh, sale price because technically they did raise the price and then they dropped it back down. So technically it is a sale, but not really because the price was never that, it shouldn't have been that high to begin with, right? So sometimes they'll pull these little tricks on you and market mavens would notice, right? So if grocery stores do this too often, then people, then these market mavens would notice and they would tell all their friends that this grocery store is just being a snake and they're uh, trying to rip people off and they're trying to do these unethical business practices, then don't go to this grocery store, right? So whereas like 99% of people, even if the grocery store does this on a regular basis, uh, they will probably not notice, right? So uh, market mavens and just mavens in general, actually, are the ones that really audit the information and try to, uh, you know, summarize and accumulate this knowledge uh, just for the fact of helping people. So another example might be buying a car, right? So I'm sure we all know uh, one or two friends that are really into cars. And if you're buying a new car, you might want to ask them what car to buy. And they would obviously be able to tell you uh, what's a good deal and what's a bad deal. So for example, in this book, uh, Mark Albert is a example of what a maven is so the way that the author describes what a maven is is that a maven is uh, they're not salespeople; they're just information brokers right so a broker is just sort of a, a conveyor of information so then they take information and then they give it uh, to someone else who might not have the time to research all of this stuff themselves and lastly we move on to salespeople or salesmen uh, so we talk about the story of Tom Gao, right, who is a very sociable guy. And his deal is actually selling information. So if you look at the difference between connectors, mavens, and salespeople, uh, you would notice that they form sort of a web of people that are necessary to for this information to pass around in society. Uh, and these people might be few and far in between. So that's why... Uh, this chapter is called The Law of the Few. And we'll see later in this book uh, how connectors, mavens, and salespeople sort of work together to help an idea spread and help establish a tipping point. So I think that's it for the synopsis for this week. Uh, and yeah, we'll pick up with chapter three next week. So I'll see you guys next week. And again, stay safe out there. Make sure you wash your hands. Use hand sanitizer if you have any. Uh, make sure you give this video a like if you enjoyed the video. And consider subscribing if you like the series. With that being said, bye-bye.